Hey what is up mortals welcome to season 1 part 1 of what if quirks were outlawed. Now with that out of the way, let's get into the video. Generations ago, an unprecedented phenomenon fundamentally altered the course of history itself. In an instant, laws and culture and warfare were all categorically obsolete due to one unforeseen change in the layout of human DNA. In a solemn concrete jungle, a glowing child was born and the age of quirks was ushered in whether the world was ready or not. As years passed, the quirkless passed away and the quirk population bolstered itself. Even more appalling was the types of abilities a small handful were born with. They were more than just intriguing gimmicks. They were truly powerful supernatural capabilities thought impossible by every scientific body in the world. As legal ramifications for quirk use grew more robust and multifaceted, their legal usage became exceedingly more limited. Vigilantism appeared and developed into its own microcosm as a means to curb the rapidly evolving criminal underworld. Unfortunately, the governments of every nation overlooked the potential value in crime fighters and opted to outlaw the public use of quirks completely. And with a sputter, the flicker of hope that was a potential hero society was stamped out by the oppressive boot of federalism. At birth, it seemed like none of the minutiae of the past century of rapid development and reformation would affect Izuku Midori. He was born quirkless, after all. This lack of a quirk granted the young man a sense of normalcy. Even though more than 80% of the population had some sort of abnormal trait, inversely, it left him with this transcendental, unobtainable, vague craving for something more. He yearned for a purpose that a salaryman or lawyer or doctor or police officer couldn't hope to achieve. The young man had a social life, he had friends, participated in extracurricular activities, joined a litany of clubs. Nothing quenched his thirst for stimulus. Consciously, the lack of quirk did nothing to hold him back. In fact, those with especially potent powers were oftentimes looked down on as potential threats to society. They could crack at any time, people thought. The government had pushed the heinous propaganda that those with such capabilities were naturally unhinged. That was, this was vehemently pushed unless you were one of the few exceptional cases proposed to be included in the lauded ranks of the AQTF. The Anti-Quirk Task Force, a federal body of professionals meant to deal with quirk-related terrorism anytime the need arose. Members of the organization were cherry-picked from the most prestigious schools and trained from 15 onwards into becoming an indomitable cog in the needlessly complex inner workings of a radically anti-quirk society. Aldera Junior High was no such esteemed learning establishment. None of the students there had exceptional abilities, none save for Katsuki Bakugo, that is. In a world which supported strength above all, or in a world where threatening powers were nurtured into something respectable, the young blonde might have been seen as something profoundly exceptional. Instead, he was lambasted and ostracized until he crept further and further into reclusion. Midoriya cared for Bakugo, respected him, even. As children, they would play at the park and every time the red-eyed boy was harassed because of his birth defect, He'd meet them full force with his own remark or even with physical retribution. His willpower and fortitude stood unmatched against the volley of threats and slights he experienced. Even a dogged, tenacious fireball of a youth still faltered after years of being beaten down and disrespected by nearly every person in his life. It ate Midoriya up inside, seeing his childhood friends luster dim with every passing day. In a way more palpable than being born without a quirk, the fact that he couldn't feasibly stand up for this disdained boy. It angered him. It made him feel worthless and afraid. It drained him of the little hope he had in the nation he grew up in. The pallid grey sky carried a tactile dreariness that bore down on every inch of his walk home. Splinters of rain pelted the tarmac below, staining the green-haired boy's uniform with the stench of fresh precipitation. He pinched the bridge of his nose betwixt his thumb and forefinger. As the date for his class's ascension to high school drew near, the need for him to make amends with his former playmate grew in intensity. Today was the day. He'd just catch him on the way home, where their paths converged, and let him know that even after everything Midoriya still had his back, nothing would change that. His eyes stayed glued to the concrete path, his viridian irises idly tracked the swirling groundwater as it snaked through crags and cracks and slinked away into the depths of the sewer. By his estimation, he'd run into Bakugo in the next block or two. An explosion. The shockwave rattled the boy's chest behind his fair skin and rang in the boy's ears with such clarity that he almost wanted to claw away at them until the tinnitus disappeared completely. He glanced in the direction of the cacophony with apprehension flooding his vision. What could have caused that? There was a young girl, a student from their class. Her carcass sat face down in a puddle of crimson-stained rain. She was limp. A couple of older men, both late high school or older, towered over her with snarling expressions. Their teeth glinted off the subtle reflections of minimal sunlight like a window catching the glare of passing headlights. Their eyes were angry and dull. They had nothing to lose and everything to gain. Back Hugo was at the epicenter of it all, his arms cocked back in defiance and his palms sparking with unyielding fury. He let off a chain of micro-explosions between his fingertips almost unintentionally, a sign of things to come. 
a rivulet of blood tracked down the right side of his face like a freshly paved road. One of the thugs pounced on the young blonde with a switchblade, catching an explosion to the jaw for his trouble. It blew him back with such impressive force that he thumped off of the opposing wall and produced a spider web of fractures along its surface. In the blink of an eye, the other thug slipped from one place to another, burying the end of a metal baseball bat into the back of Katsuki's skull with a dull crack. It was a sickening sound, almost as visceral as the sheer and terrifying reverberation that was his explosive quirk. He dropped to his knees, desperately clutching at his skull with one hand as his other raised to blast the ruffian. The next strike from the bat caught his wrist, making the boy instinctively retract his arm as a means to protect it. Damn it, he yelped, his voice haggard and raspy. His shaking hands reached out for the dead girls. Izuku's legs acted before he could think. As the criminal lifted his weapon for a final strike, he bolted down the length of the alleyway, tearing his bag from his shoulder and launching it at his new opponent. He'd never been in a fight, no even a schoolyard scuffle. Now he was saving a life. For the first time, the lifeblood known as Purpose pulsed through his weary heart. The vagrant turned his attention to the messy-haired young man as the bag slugged him in the face. Recoiling from the unforeseen strike, he took a wild swing at Midoriya that just barely missed the mark. The teen retaliated with an unrefined right haymaker that caught him just below the solar plexus. The criminal staggered and gasped, regaining his composure and digging the heel of his chukka boot into the boy's gut with enough force to sling him into the side of the building. His skull bounced off the concrete like a pinball. His brain shivered within the confines of his cranium. Everything had an afterimage, and his vision slipped in and out as he heaved and clutched at his stomach. Midoriya could barely make out the vagrant spitting on his palms and tightening his grasp around the hilt of his bludgeon before the loudest noise he had ever heard met his ears. It was the sound of rain whipping against a massive object traveling at an unreasonably high speed, the sound of leather jostling against extreme wind resistance, the sound of heavy boots spurning the blacktop as they screeched to a halt. And, finally, the sound of a fist threatening to break the sound barrier as it turned the left side of the villain's ribcage into shards of bone and cartilage. His eyes took time to adjust. Though as it did he realized that the man before him was like none he had ever seen. He was tall, unimaginably so, over seven feet. His dirty blonde hair was slicked back and windswept, save for two prominent bangs that traced the outline of his chiseled face. He had a jagged scar running from the center of his eyebrow to just below the outer corner of his right eye. His irises were a brilliant royal blue. He donned a massive trench coat with his hands buried in the pockets. It's all right, son. I've got you. His voice was clear and baritone, though its timbre held a crestfallen note for longer than expected. He wasted no time scooping the duo of boys up in his mighty arms. Before he knew it, Midoriya had slipped out of consciousness. Before we get back into the story, I would like to say that we've got a second channel called Anime Deep Dive. Anime Deep Dive goes over the hard facts of the anime presented. Now in case, you guys didn't know, we have a third channel called We the Celestial Naruto What If. We the Celestial Naruto What If mainly focuses on our Naruto What If series. If you are interested in content like this, please go check the description below or click the eye icon in the top right corner. Now with that out of the way, let's get back into the story. The young man stirred awake. A surprising weight bore down on his shoulders, which he quickly discovered to be a massive leather trench coat big enough to fit three of him. In fact, he wasn't alone in the coat. Bakugo rested right next to him, still out cold from the frightening interaction. The freckle-faced adolescent lethargically clambered to his feet and clutched at his head. It pounded with streaks of agony almost in time with his heartbeat. His eyes widened as everything hit him at once. They were attacked. A girl was killed. Someone he had never seen before had saved them. As all of this knocked around in his head, the thin streak of light from a nearby door widened as it grew more and more ajar. Midoriya squeezed his eyes shut as the lights flipped on, a dull buzz emanating from them as they surged to life in a brilliant array of artificial yellow. They were dull by most standards, but the young man found it nearly unbearable with his severe concussion. Filling up the threshold entirely was the silhouette of the man that saved them, Sans coat. He flashed the young man a soft smile. Are you okay, young man? His voice had all the qualities related to a paternal figure. Even with his threadbare exterior, Midoriya could tell that he was undoubtedly a good man. I hope the medicine we gave you was enough to quell the migraine you probably have. My head is still killing me, Izuku replied, albeit hoarsely. The large man frowned at the news. That's a shame. I'm sorry. He opted to take a seat on a nearby crate, his attention turning to the boy still coddled beneath his overcoat. Has he shown any signs of waking up? The vigilante added. Why didn't you just take us to the hospital? Midoriya paused, noticeably panicked. What about the girl? Is she all right? She was dead before I got there. I called the police anonymously so she didn't have to lay out in the rain anymore. He replied solemnly, casting his eyes down in remorse. What are your names? The massive man questioned, raising his chin to make eye contact with the boy. I'm Izuku Midoriya, and that's my classmate Katsuki Bakugo. 
We're junior high students. Goodness, you're both so young. Everything he said held a spark of anguish within it. This man was tired of the world. That much was apparent. You can call me Tashinori. I didn't take you to the hospital because, frankly, me and my friends are in a bad way. I used my quirk to save you, if you didn't notice, so I could have very well been arrested if I turned you in myself. I didn't want you kids catching a cold or dying of your wounds waiting for the paramedics, either. My friends think it's dumb for me to trust you two to keep us a secret, but sometimes my naivety gets the better of me. Tashinori chuckled, rubbing the back of his neck anxiously. I couldn't call myself a hero if I left kids that tried protecting an innocent out for the elements to take. That'd haunt me, hero, Midoriya questioned, tilting his head and squinting his eyes in confusion. Yeah, we're heroes. The weary crime fighter raised a flexed bicep, slapping it in the way a strongman does to showboat. He laughed heartily, though I suppose vigilante is the word most would use. Midoriya pondered for a moment. Vigilantes were barely mentioned anymore, not even on the news. Yet here one was, a flickering beacon of a bygone era. The strength he presented was incalculable. As the clarity of their conflict returned to his memory, the green-haired teen realized that the extent of his physical might was absolutely appalling. He was moving faster than the boy could track with his eye. Not to mention the deafening sound of Tashinori's punch threatened to take away Izuku's hearing indefinitely. The young man swallowed, taking a few more moments to study his savior. All right, he paused to groan and let out a subtle cough. I ought to show you to the rest of them so they actually believe me when I say you're not gonna rat us out. Follow me, young Midoriya. The duo stepped through the threshold into the cramped, decrepit confines of a long-abandoned warehouse. It reeked of musk and mildew and other unsightly things that the youth couldn't quite put his finger on. Beneath the scrutiny of a handful of small table lamps rested two more men, both much thinner than the brutish Goliath that was Tashinori. One idly typed away on his laptop. A tired-eyed man in his early thirties with a scar on his cheek and his dark, messy swath of hair tied tightly. As he glanced up, the scrutiny of his shaded irises became more apparent. His was judgmental, but the other man's was far, far more ominous. He was an abnormally tall, relatively built man with wild hair kept upright with a red bandana. A white face mask sat snugly around his face. His hands worked mindlessly at sharpening a serrated combat knife as his irises stared headlong at the boy. It was rife with contempt. The one on the computer is Aizawa, and the other is Kai he was cut off. You're going to tell the little rodent our names, Tashinori. The man with the bandana growled. He can call me Stan if he truly needs a title. He's right. That wasn't very rational of you. You can't just scoop schoolboys up off the street and give them information on us. Aizawa added, still working away on his computer. I won't tell anyone anything, I assure you, Midoriya said, relinquishing a warm, nervous smile. Although these guys seemed intimidating, the beating of his heart during that critical moment in the alley still stuck with him. Maybe this was serendipity. See, you guys have nothing to worry about. This little guy wouldn't hurt a fly. Tashinori scoffed lightheartedly, patting the boy on the shoulder. His bravado and energy seemed far removed from the other two men he worked with. What the hell's going on here? A voice from behind. Bakugo, now awake, leaned against the threshold. His knees threatened to buckle. Were we kidnapped? What did you bastards do? His hands sparked to life. He was looking to fight even though he could barely stand. The trio of vigilantes took account of that unrelenting tenacity. No, no. They saved us, Kakin. Their heroes, Midoriya had turned to face his childhood friend. A welcoming smile now stretched across his face. And I think that maybe we should be heroes too. Thank you all for watching the video to the end. Now there is a few more things that I'd like to go over before the video ends. On behalf of We the Celestials I'd like to thank the writer for this video, as well as the editor for this video. Their details will be in the description. If you're a voice actor, editor or writer, or you're interested in becoming one of those, go to the Discord that is in the description of this video and hit up the head of one of those areas. We're always looking for members to join us. That's it from us for today's video. So thank you all for watching and don't forget to hit that subscribe button if you're interested and hit that like button if you liked the video. Until next time, peace out mortals, have an amazing day.